Hey, good evening. It's uh, Sunday evening time for our Old Testament studies. Thanks for joining us. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. If you've been keeping up, uh, Solomon has gone through all these experiments. He's trying to figure out, uh, looking at the way people look at things under the sun, if they don't think of things that there's more than just what meets the eye, in other words. He's kind of coming to the end of his experiments now. In chapter 7, he's sitting around thinking. He's just contemplating things, and he's coming up. With, here's, he's going to tell us what he's found. And um, some of it's correct, and some of it I question. So let, let's look at it. It's not like I'm questioning the Bible. It's like I, this is uh, the way Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. He's sitting around here. Here's how people apart from God think, and he's but he finally comes around to the last chapter and says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Don't fear God. Remember him when you're young. Don't wait till you're old. If you are old, remember him now. But the best way is to remember him when you're young. Uh, it's the conclusion of the whole matter. He said, fear God. Chapter 7. Here's what he's come up with in his contemplations of the wise man. He said, a, a, good, man, a good name, a good name is better than precious ointment. A good name is better than all the medicine in the world. And uh, that's, that's true. I mean, we, we're wise enough to know that ourselves, aren't we, that uh, it can take a whole lifetime to build a good reputation, but you can lose it in a minute. Uh, but a good name's better than a precious ointment. And he said, in the day of one's death, then the day of one's birth. The day, the day of one's death, he said, better than the day that you're born. And, uh, well, <clears throat> maybe uh, Solomon, I, sometimes I think... Uh, and I, and I like to think it's a literary technique that Solomon himself wasn't making these conclusions himself, thinking apart from God and under the sun. He's trying to show us that's how people apart from God think. Uh, but he sort of, if this was just somebody apart from God sitting around thinking they were just depressed, they say, oh, it's better the day of your death, better than the day of your birth. And... Uh, in other words, they're kind of saying they want to die. But for the Christian, there's a deeper truth than that, that the day of your death is better than the day of your birth because for the Christian, you know, the day that you came into this world, you came into a world full of sin and suffering. But when we live this life and, and we go through death, for the Christian, that's into the next world. And the sin and the suffering's gone, and it's a better world than the one we came into the first time. That's why you got to be born again, be born to the second world. It's better, verse 2, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that's the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Now, I agree with this. Uh, as, a, as a preacher, I've, I've thought that way myself a lot of times, that... Uh, it's better to go to the funeral home. <laughs> this might not sound right to somebody that's not a preacher, but um, for us preachers, we think, uh, I'd rather preach a funeral than do a wedding. The wedding's happy and everything, and you're there officiating and all this kind of stuff, and there's usually some mom-in-law or something, future mom-in-law, telling you what to do and where to stand and all this kind of stuff, and nobody's really paying any attention. It's not a really a good opportunity, it seems like, to, to share the gospel. But when you go to the funeral home, man, you've usually got people there that never hear the gospel. And they, they're listening. Their thoughts are on eternity at that time. And they'll listen to what you say. You never have a better opportunity, preacher, than to, to share the gospel with folks at the, at the funeral home. So in that way of looking at it, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that's the end of all men. We go to that funeral home and see whoever's laying up there is the guest of honor in that box. It reminds us that, that that's our end of two. If we're just looking at things under the sun, that's the end. That's, that's where we're all headed, going to our long home, as Solomon says in chapter 12 here. And the living will lay it to heart. Think about these things. That's absolutely true. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by it, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart's made better. I don't know, there may be some truth to that sometimes, but... Uh, I'd rather be uh, be happy than sad, wouldn't you? I'd rather be laughing than uh, ha be, have a heart full of sorrow when it, when it comes to the daily life, wouldn't you? And uh, that's what uh, one of our scriptures says. Uh, I believe that's Proverbs. It says, laughter does good like a medicine. <laughs> and, and that's true. Laughter is just good for you, ain't it? 
The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Now, if you're wise, you're hard to think about the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. In other words, the wise, they'll think about that funeral home that we're all headed to one of these days, and they'll lay it to heart. But the foolish, all they can think about is getting back to the bar, the house of mirth, and they consider not their end. Verse 5, he says, it's, he's, here's one of the things he's discovered in his contemplations and just experiments of life that it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Now, at the time being, we, we don't like to be rebuked, but to, if we'll take it appropriately and grow from it, that's much better than just uh, listening to the song of fools all the time. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, I guess they're popping, popping and cracking as their thorns are, he said, so is the laughter of a fool. This is also vanity. Or the laughter of a fool is like a, something, we'd say like the dripping of the kitchen sink. It's something that gets on your nerves. <laughs> Surely oppression makes a wise man glad, and a gift or bribe destroys the heart. Bribes are bad. The Bible all through there condemns bribes. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. I can agree with that. Too. Some people are marvelous starters. <laughs> but they never finish. It's better to be a good finisher than a good starter, especially with your Christian life. It's one thing to pray the sinner's prayer, but you know, continue a journey and grow. It's better than the, the end of the things, better than the beginning of it. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Boy, he got that right. He's, he's looked around and he said, it's better. I'd rather have patient people than arrogant people. And the Bible always content, condemns, condemns arrogance. That's a great sin. Be not hasty in your spirit to be angry. Don't fly off the handle too quickly. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. It's foolish to fly off the angle too anger. <laughs> fly off the handle too quickly too often. Verse 10. Say not thou, don't you say what's the cause that the former days were better than these. Now we all, as we get older, we all say that, don't we? It, the good old days were better because we Really, I don't know if they were or not. We, we remember the good parts of them, but they had their bad times too. And it's just kind of what you, and, and, so, and Solomon says here, don't say that the, why, why was the good old days better? There's a lot of things better than they were in the good old days. We've got the stuff that can cure things back then that would kill you. And that's, that's a good thing. And we look around and say, well, people are really sinful. People have always been sinful. Ever since the Garden of Eden fall, people have been sinful. But, um, he says, don't you say what's the cause that the former days were better than these, for thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Verse 11 is absolute. I agree 100% with you, Solomon, that wisdom is good with an inheritance. Because if you've lived long enough, you've probably seen somebody that got an inheritance and it ruined them and they ran through it and everything else. So you need wisdom to go with an inheritance. And by it, I guess that's the, uh, the wisdom there's profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense. That's true, ain't it? Wisdom's a defense against a lot of things. And money is a defense. You know, if you've got some money, if you're fortunate enough to have some money, this can be a defense against sickness and health problems and everything else. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. Nothing's better than wisdom, he's saying. Consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he's made crooked? Well, that's absolutely true. We live in a society, I think, where, uh, where God's call, called some things crooked and the society's trying to ca call them straight. Whereas Isaiah prophesied long ago, I believe we're living in that day where Isaiah said there's a day coming that they'll call evil good and they'll call good evil. But if it's the work of God, if it's the word of God, then we, we already know what's straight and what's crooked. We can't change that. 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider God set one over against the other. Be joyful if you're living in the day of prosperity. But remember, sometimes the days of adversity follow right on their heels. To the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. And here's one thing he says. There's a just man that perishes in his righteousness. 
Now, ultimately, Jesus was the only just man on his own who perished as a righteous man. The rest of us are sinners that are, have the imputed righteousness of Christ by grace through faith. But Paul, Solomon's looked around at the folks in his days, and he said, I've noticed that some good people, some calamity happens to them, and they, they die early, and, and they just really didn't deserve that. And he says, but there is a wicked man. He says, I've noticed that sometimes the wicked people, they live a long time in their wickedness. And he's looking at that as somebody under the sun and saying, that just ain't just. And Solomon needs to talk to the psalmist. I don't know if this is one of David's psalms or not, but one of the psalmists said, uh, why do the wicked prosper? And as he asked that question, he goes on in the psalm, and then he said, then I went to the house of God, and I considered their end. And so there is justice in the end. It's not justice in this world, but there's ultimate justice, isn't there? Be not righteous over much, or don't be overly righteous. Or we would say, don't you be self-righteous, because all our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. We're just dependent on the righteousness of Christ to be credited to us. So don't be overly righteous. Neither make yourself overwise. Don't don't think you're wiser than you are. Don't be conceited. Why? Because here's what happened. Why should you destroy yourself? Don't be self-righteous and think you're a know-it-all. <laughs> don't be a self-righteous know-it-all. There you go. And, and on the flip side, he says, don't be over much wicked. Don't be overly wicked. <laughs> or don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? And uh, boy, we just looking at the news this week and thinking about people doing foolish things out there drinking and driving and dying before their time. Don't, don't be overly foolish and overly white, wicked because uh, it'll catch up with you in this world and the next. 18. It's good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not your hand. And, and boy, he's finally got it figured out here in verse 18. For, for he that fears God shall come forth of them all. He said, that's the best thing. The people that fear God says that they're the winners in the end. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. True, isn't it? Wisdom is more powerful. Uh, um, well, there's an old saying that says the pen is mightier than the sword, only because the pen has to be filled with wisdom. For there's not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not. Now, Solomon may be looking at this in kind of a depressed way. He says, I've looked around. He said, there ain't a just man on the whole earth. Everybody's a sinner. Well, he was absolutely in agreement with God. He said, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are just on our own. We all are guilty of sin. And uh, thank, thank God that uh, there is forgiveness and grace available to everybody that's alive right now. Uh, but Solomon looked at it, and he figured it out. He says, uh, everybody sinners. Nobody that sins not. 21, also take no heed unto all words that are spoken. Don't pay attention to everything you hear, people talking about you. It'll drive you crazy. <laughs> Lest you hear your servant curse thee. For, and then consider this, because just think of yourself. You've done the same thing. You've talked to Ed about people and stuff too. Just oftentimes your own heart knows that you yourself likewise has cursed others. All this have I proved or tested or found out by my experiments. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I'll be wise. But it was far from me. Now, God bragged on Solomon about being wise, but Solomon was wise enough that he also understood there's a lot of things that I haven't figured out yet either. <laughs> he said, that which is far off and exceeding deep who can find it? Who can find it out? 25, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek. Now, that's what wise people do when they want to learn something. They work at it. They, they, they incline their heart to know and they seek and they work at it and they, they dig deep to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. And to, But he, he looked at the flip side, too. I think he did experiments maybe to try, try to figure out the way the other side lived. To know the wickedness of folly or foolishness, even of foolishness and madness. And, and of all the things that Solomon found out, this is kind of funny, you're going to laugh about it, but Solomon's probably serious. He said, of all the things that I found out in this world, 
I, I find this more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands are as shackles. <laughs> She's got bound up. Who pleases God, whoever pleases God will escape her. <laughs> but the sinner will be taken by her. Or Solomon looked out and uh, remember we find out in other books of the Bible that Solomon had, what was it, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. <laughs> He, he knew about women, but he said, he, that may have been what he was talking about in the other verse. He figured out every one of them sinners. And he says, uh, boy, you better live for God because that can be a punishment from God. You get hooked up with the wrong one here. I, ho I hope you've got a good one and you'll remember that because they are rare. Proverbs says they're, they're rarer than precious jewels and, and rubies. If you got a good one, you better let her know that you appreciate her and uh, not, not mess up here. Because he said, she's a gift of God. Whoever pleases God will uh, escape from that bad one, but, but the sinner will take her. <laughs> Behold this I found, saith the preacher. That's what Solomon's calling himself here. I figured this out by math, counting one by one to find out the account. Which yet my soul seeketh, but I can't find out, I find not. He said, one man among a thousand have I found. I think he said, of a thousand men, you might find one good one out there. <laughs> but a woman among all those I've not found. He said, I can't find one in a thousand good women. <laughs> now, Solomon was a man. If there's a woman writing this, she'd probably write it the opposite way. It's just human nature here. But he said, this one he did find, though, verse 29. He said, Lo, this only have I found, that God made man upright. That's true. God made man in God's image. He made us upright. But they have sought out many inventions, and that's absolutely true. He, he made man in his image. He made man righteous. But it's since the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed him and fell into sin and all the descendants of Adam and Eve were conceived in sin and born in sin were also made many wicked inventions. And that's absolutely true. But I've got good news for you because that's the people that Jesus said that he came to save. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. They ain't got nothing to repent of at the righteous but they're just self-righteous because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. But Jesus said, I come to save sinners. And the good news is the Bible says you and I are in that boat so we can be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. See you next week.